What's the most complicated thing your brain's ever done? Well, for me, it's always felt like it's been my job. Like most doctors, I studied for about seven years, read hundreds of books, and spent about six weeks sitting exams. All in all, my career has proved to be a bit of a challenge to my grey matter up here. But where I'm going now, my brain is going to have to perform a more complex task than anything it does during my professional life. And surprisingly, it's something that we all do without even really thinking about it. Tonight, I'm going to a party. It may seem effortless, but whenever you mix with other people, your mind performs phenomenally complex tasks at a dizzying speed. In fact, what we do at a party would leave the world's most powerful computer standing. From the moment you enter a room, you pick out one face from another. You begin a series of detailed assessments of every one. From what their faces tell you, you decide what you think of them and even start to understand what they are thinking. In this program, I'll be exploring how our mind does this. Join me and find out how what happens in a place like this shapes the world we live in. This is the story of how we relate to other people. And understanding how our mind does that can help us use it better. We'll see experiments that show the hidden potential of your mind. We'll learn how to tell a fake smile from a real one. How to tell if someone really likes you. How to spot a liar. Throughout this, I can tell you a complete truth. We'll discover how an experience like this can tell me who to trust. And we'll find out just what our mind must do to win the friendship and love of those who matter most. We all rely on our mind as we try to win over people that we've never met before. Are you sitting nicely? Yes, we are! But the mind of 30-year-old primary school teacher Mia Bragg is about to face a particularly tough challenge. Something very special. What's happening to Miss Bragg in the holiday? Um, Mahadi. You're getting married. I'm getting married. But as well as tying the knot, Mia will also have to get to know dozens of people she's never met. New Zealand, that's where his family are. And I haven't met his mum, I haven't met his dad, I haven't met his sister, so I'm going all the way over there to meet his family. When are you getting married? I'm getting married on the 15th of August. <laughs> it's been an absolute whirlwind since me and Matt met. It's been like a fairy tale. Come, we met, and then a month and a half later, he moved in. Um, and then just after a month after that, we got engaged. Um, and it will be 10 months that we would have actually known each other when we get married. Ask her if Paul and they're coming around on Friday. Uh, um, Mia will have to assess, understand, and win round Matthew's family. It'll be one of the most complicated things her mind has ever done and we'll be following her as she tries to do it. Yeah, on Friday, yeah. Ah! No, we'll get on with them. <laughs> shake a baby, shake a cause of love when you take a me. But why is getting on with people so complicated for our mind? Well, let's start at the beginning. 
First, we have to be able to tell each person apart. It sounds obvious, but it's vitally important that your mind can tell one person from the other. If we couldn't do that, life would be very difficult indeed. But wait a minute, something's wrong. Oh, 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 you mixed up so Juliana, it's so delicious, everybody come capisce. Just imagine if all faces looked the same. It would be a nightmare, even if we didn't all look like me. That's nice. <clears throat> but of course, we don't all look the same. We can tell each other apart, and it's a skill we start to develop the first chance we get. Up, keep it 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 up. Very good. Another one? Push. Oh my god. Longer push. Ah! Push like that again. Don't let it slip back. Come on, push. Just one long push and Come finish. On. Come on, Kerry, push it. Come on, Kerry. Push again. Come on. And again, push, Kerry. Yes. Oh this is the last one. Come on, Kerry. Keep panting now. Okay. Open your legs and pant. Keep panting. Ah! Utterly defenseless, this little girl seems to have come into the world with few social skills. I name this Isla. <laughs> but she does have one crucial one, and within seconds of being born, she uses it. Try to open eyes. Try to open eyes. Through the blur of her first sight, baby Isla instinctively turns towards a face. This strengthens the bond between her and her mother. But this, the first face she's ever seen, is also physically altering her brain. This first moment of Isla's social life is stimulating her brain at the tiniest level. Our brain contains complex networks of brain cells called neurons. Like all of us, Isla has been born with a staggering 100 billion of them. These neurons are connected to each other at tiny junctions called synapses. As Isla sees her mother's face for the first time, an electrical signal is created. This signal travels through these synapses along a pathway which is unique to her mother's face. As she sees another face, her father's, a different pathway is stimulated in her brain. brain will adapt and develop, creating many more pathways as she meets new people. But even at this tender age, a baby's ability to distinguish between faces is almost unbelievable. What now? What now? Like all babies, little Grace here can look at the faces of primates, like these lemurs, and actually tell one from another. What's it doing? But what's interesting is that her older sister can't. To her, all these lemurs look the same. So how are you doing? Well, let's make it easier for you. Can you tell them apart now? No? Well, you're not alone. Because it turns out that even people who've spent a lifetime studying primates like these lemurs can't tell their faces apart. But just like little Grace, there was a time in our lives 
when all of us could. And scientists at Sheffield University have proved it. They showed primate faces to two sets of babies. One group under six months, the other over nine months. To start with, all the babies looked at the faces and their attention was held. But when the researchers tried again with a different face, the results were astonishing. The older babies refused to look at the new face. They were bored. They thought they'd seen it before. Clearly, they couldn't see the difference in the two faces. But when the younger babies were shown the new face, it was a different story. They were fascinated. That's because they could see that this was a different lemur. But in order to get on in a world of humans, all babies have to lose this extraordinary skill. So what happens to make a baby's brain more like their parents? The aunt tells us a lot about the way our brain develops its ability to communicate with other people. A baby's brain is a little bit like this tray of cress, with all the seeds representing individual connections or synapses, all doing different jobs. From the moment we're born, the number of connections flourishes. An explosion in the number of connections will leave a baby with one and a half times as many synapses as an adult. This makes them able to adapt to the world around them, but it also gives them skills they'll simply never need, like recognizing the difference in primate faces. With this extraordinary abundance of connections at our disposal, we actually have too many. Our brain needs to specialize. Some connections are allowed to live. Others are left to die. When it comes to face recognition, it all depends who you look at. Human babies grow up looking entirely at human faces, so the connections that process these continue to survive and grow. Meanwhile, what we don't use, we lose, including the connections that recognize primate faces. That means, by 10 months, our skills at recognizing the difference in human faces are better than ever. As babies, the world around us is literally changing the shape of our brains. Our synapses are being pruned to make us expert at dealing with other human beings, which is just as well because the world is about to get a good deal more complicated. After seeing only a few faces in the earliest months of our lives, we go on to meet many, many thousands. But because our minds now specialize in human faces, we become experts in distinguishing one from another. In fact, of the six billion people on Earth, most of us would be able to see a difference between every one of them. But even this isn't really enough. Telling faces apart is one thing, but working out what we think of them is quite another. And doing this places extra demands on our brain. Not only does your mind have to recognize faces, but it also has to read them. It's a bit like looking at that timetable over there. You may know what you're looking at, 
But unless you can understand what it all means, you're not going to get very far. Reading faces is key to how we form those all-important first impressions. It's the next step towards achieving what so much of our brain is devoted to. Getting on with people. Getting to know you. Getting to know all about you. Getting to like you. Getting to hope you like me. Getting to know you. Putting it my way when I sleep. None of Mia Bragg's family is able to be with her at her wedding in New Zealand. She'll be on her own as she meets her future in-laws for the first time. If Mia and her husband are to make a new life out there, it's vital that she gets on with them. I suppose I'm worried that if I go out there and I don't like it, you know, how can I turn around and say that you know, I don't, don't feel that this is the base that I want for the rest of my life. So yeah, I am definitely worried. It's a lot to think about. Once she reaches New Zealand, no relationship will matter more than the one between her and Matthew's mother, Mira. I think Mum's going to be excited, but she's also going to be very nervous about it too. I mean, it's not, not every day your son brings home a a girl from overseas. Mum and me are both very, very strong-willed people and they would both call a spade a spade. And that's where I could see conflict coming into the equation. I say it as it is. You know, if I don't like something, I say it, you know, whether they like it or not. It's too bad. <laughs> If it's been bugging me for a while or someone's annoyed me for a while, I'm then, bang, they get a mouthful. And, um, and that's how it is. So if Mia wants, you know, to get on, she's just got to be herself. Yeah, I have some notes. you drink the coffee? It's been cold. Huh? It is cold. How are you feeling? Keep going hot and cold. <laughs> I've got heartburn now as well. <laughs> I'm just hoping that I am the right person to his mum and dad. I hope I come across as the person that's going to make him happy, and but I don't know because I don't know them. <laughs> After months of waiting, much of how Mia and Mira feel about each other will be decided by their first impressions. First moments of a meeting, our mind goes into overdrive. As well as processing and storing faces, it registers countless signals. 
but one signal, more than any other, affects the first impression we have of someone. The smile. It makes us feel they mean us no harm. But in fact, your mind doesn't always know whether or not a smile is genuine. That is, unless you know what to look for. This is actress Jacqueline, and according to the world's leading facial expressions expert, she has one of the best fake smiles in the business. But with our help, you'll be able to tell when even she is faking it. <laughs> I think that kind of smells more. Jacqueline appears to enjoy buying flowers. Hi, how are you? And she seems happy to have met a friend. But a trained eye could spot that one of these smiles is in fact a fake. And that's because they're controlled by different parts of Jacqueline's brain. A fake smile involves a direct signal from one area of her brain to another. The part that plans what Jacqueline's going to do sends a signal directly to the part that controls her physical movement. This moves the muscles around her mouth and makes her smile. But no matter how hard she tries, there are parts of her face that this type of signal cannot reach. A genuine smile involves a different type of signal, one that takes a more complicated route. When her senses are stimulated by a genuinely pleasurable experience, this signal passes through the part of the brain that processes emotion. Here, it's boosted so that when it arrives at the area controlling Jacqueline's facial muscles, it not only moves her mouth, it also moves the muscles around her eyes. They crease up and her eyebrow dips ever so slightly. Signs that show that of Jacqueline's two smiles, the one at the flower stall was the real thing. And however pleased she seemed to see her friend, she was, in fact, acting. So understanding what's going on in someone else's brain can help you form a more accurate first impression from their smile. Just watch for the lines around their eyes. But the first impressions we form of people are also shaped by what happens in our own brains. In fact, our brain makes countless judgments about people without us being aware of it. And perhaps the most basic of these is, do I trust this person? To find out just how our mind makes that decision, I've come to the coast of South Africa and to some of the most hazardous waters in the world. When we see a person that we don't trust, there's a specific area of the brain that's stimulated. It's like a bell that rings to tell us not to trust them. And crucially, it's the same bell that rings when we're frightened. Which is bad news for me, because in order to show how this trust area of the brain works, I've got to become really frightened. So I've come here not to meet an untrustworthy person, but to meet one tonne of great white shark.
Right in the center of my brain is that area which triggers fear and distrust, and it's called the amygdala. Every time a shark approaches, it's stimulated. However much I try, I can't stop it happening. And it's that area inside my head which is causing me to feel like this at the moment. It's a really not, not a very safe situation. It's really rough, frightening. I'm very happy not to do that again, I think, for a while. What's interesting is that although I knew the shark couldn't get to me through the cage, it still didn't stop me feeling terrified. My amygdala was ringing like a church bell, and it's clear that we've no control over that part of the brain which registers both fear and distrust. And that's important when we come to meet other people face to face. So, what triggers our brain to distrust people in a way we can't control? To find out, we decided to test a panel of 12 volunteers, our jury. We showed them a lineup of five men of the same age and racial background and asked the jury to decide who they trusted the least. This test was similar to research carried out by scientists in Boston. Our results, like theirs, help reveal which facial features trigger distrust. We believe the least trustworthy to be A and the most trustworthy to be E. <laughs> so why, according to the jury's first impressions, was this man the least trusted? And why was this man a close second? The answer is written on their faces. His features really stuck out. Heavy features. As being very sort of like the little yeah. eyebrows, very sort of shifty looking. Thin, weasley features, and unfortunately for D, it was uh, his nose. The faces of both these men are non-symmetrical. They have smaller eyes and thinner faces than the other men. These features cause the feeling of distrust in the brains of our jury. And the two most trustworthy men well, both of them have broad features with smooth skin and large eyes, faces that scientists would say are baby-like. I imagine my mum going up to him and going like that. That's what made him most trustworthy for me. He was typically sun-like. When we see faces like this, without knowing it, our natural feelings for children are often hijacked, and that causes a feeling of trust in our brains that we can't control. In fact, all these men were selected because they work in highly trusted positions. So next time you meet someone you don't trust, be careful. Your brain might be fooling you. Thirty seconds ago, Mia met her fiancé for the first time. Her mind immediately began forming a first impression of her future mother-in-law. I'm not normally like this. I normally chat for England, but... Uh, um, can I just have a glass of water, please? You're not how I imagined you at all. Have I? No, I haven't seen any photos either. I was like, no, not at all. You can't describe me, you see. When I first came to the house, there were a lot of 
cold silences where people weren't talking and I know I was trying to fill them with questions or different kinds of conversation. I think I was conscious that they probably were thinking about me or making a split judgement or something more negative. And you've brought a suit? Yes. Yeah. He's got a suit. I think it'd be nice to see everyone smart. <laughs> I've written a speech. With first impressions out of the way, the process of really getting to know her new family can begin. The wedding is in four days. So this end is where we're going to get married? Yeah. What do you think, Matt? On her second day, okay. things don't seem to be getting any easier. I mean, usually those sort of decisions are not mine. Because, um, <coughs> because he's just, he's I think I'm probably the most stressed I have felt. I just want them to get to know me. I don't want them to agree with everything about me, but I want them to get to know me and me the same as them. So, yeah, we can have a bit more of a joke. Now, does the groom want to have a buttonhole that's going to match the tones that you're having, or do you just want him to go for a, a white rose just, buttonhole? Just the white rose. The more time they spend together, the more Mia starts to notice Mira's body movement. Does this provide a clue as to what she thinks of her? So that will be lovely. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't even thought about the greenery around the edge, but I think that'd be nice. Mm. Yes. <laughs> She does, does that a lot, either that or that. Um, and I think it's she's thinking, or I, it might be kind of getting in, in front of her mouth, so she's not going to say something yet. So that's how I took so it much. anyway. Or um, an extension of yourself rather than, you know... Something there are ways of watching how someone moves that can tell us what's happening in their mind. Caroline. In fact, scientists have now discovered that this can even reveal if they actually like us or not. To show this, we took two men, Mr Nice and Mr Nasty, and placed them in a controlled environment. Then we asked several volunteers to meet them and discuss different subjects. Favourite films? Yeah, well, got plenty of those. Yeah, you go first. <laughs> what the volunteers didn't know was that while Mr Nice was being friendly and warm, <laughs> Mr Nasty was being as negative and as difficult as possible. Philadelphia story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Didn't like that very much. No. Not really. But um, crucially, both Mr. Nice yeah. and Mr. Nasty yeah. have been asked to deliberately move their bodies in specific ways. So you got any more favourites? While cameras watched for a response in the volunteers that would reveal what was going on in their mind. <laughs> Gradually, as the conversations developed, an extraordinary thing began to happen. I didn't... I didn't... The volunteers with Mr Nice gradually began to copy him. They kind of used those well, and the acting was so good. They kind of all got away with it. And the other one's Last of the Mohicans. No, I didn't see that. I mean, come on, I shouldn't... There's no, no reason to suggest that we should like that, but there's something... Meanwhile, those with Mr Nasty didn't copy him at all. Well, I'm really enjoying 24 at the moment. Have you seen that? Saw it once. Yeah, no, I didn't like it very much. No? No. I think it's the sort of thing I like going to the cinema myself. Because the volunteers like Mr Nice, their mind prompted them to mimic him. No, I often go by myself. A subconscious attempt to strengthen the bond between them. Everyone says it's fantastic. I saw Eamon Holmes. Did you? Yeah. Did you speak to him? No. Scientists have known for some time that our mind automatically notices and sometimes even makes us mimic what other people are doing. What they haven't known is how the brain does it. But recently, researchers made an extraordinary breakthrough. What's more, 
they believe this discovery may even be the key to knowing what someone else is feeling. It's all to do with something that happens in our brains when we see people move. And if you want to know what that is, just watch these two crews race to that bridge. Attention! seems the secret to understanding what people feel lies in watching them move. But to know what's now happening in your brain, we have to look at what's going on in theirs. A particular part of the brain is controlling each of the physical movements they're making. But in this area, there's also a small cluster of cells which help prepare their body for its next movement. Every action, in this case it's rowing, has its own unique pattern. And scientists believe that these cells are the key to how human beings relate to each other. Because not only are these cells firing in the brains of the rowers, they're also firing in exactly the same way in the brain of anybody who's watching them. In other words, the cells which are helping these guys row now are firing in your brain and mine just as if we were rowing ourselves. That's why they're called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons mean that you and I not only are watching what these men are doing, our mind is actually feeling something of what they're feeling. Even if we haven't done all the hard work, Well, how does all this affect your social life? Well, if you know what somebody is feeling, the chances are you'll know what they're thinking. Our mirror neurons help us read other people's minds. Mind reading is the ability to know, or at least to make an informed guess, what someone else is thinking. It's one of the most amazing skills the human mind possesses. And what's more, you do it with no apparent effort. Take this woman. In an instant, you can guess what she's thinking. And what's more, by also reading the mind of the person next to her, you can work out why she's feeling this way. What about a third person watching this scene? He clearly finds it funny that this man fancies someone who doesn't fancy him. While they've been reading each other's minds, you've been reading theirs. And what was happening in our heads to make it possible is astonishing. A mirror neurons fire helping us to understand what someone else is feeling. But then, many other parts of the brain are triggered. Areas which allow us to recognize facial expressions. Areas which let us draw on memories and past experience. And then the part which puts all this information together and decides what it all means. Many different areas of the brain work together to achieve all this. 
and it happens in an instant. Virtually every time we meet someone, we try to work out what they're thinking. And this can make us say some surprising things. As actress Trisha Dibb found out when we asked her to do some retail therapy with a difference. <laughs> she agreed to pick out the most unsuitable clothes she could find to make her look as unattractive as possible. I would look awful in that. We'll have to have it. Oh, I haven't worn these since I was 16. Gotta have them. Look at them. What do you think? I would look absolutely awful in that. It's nice. It's nice and see through. Good. I do like a bit of glitter. Once she'd made her selection, she would ask unsuspecting passers by what they thought. Would people tell Trisha the truth? I can't go out like that. Or would they read her mind and tell her what they thought she wanted to hear? Excuse me. Do you think these trousers suit me? Yeah, mm -hmm. I do, actually. Yeah? Yeah, they don't, they're not tight. They're not too tight? No, they're not. Oh, it gets worse and worse. Excuse me. Hello. It suits me, does it, you think? Yeah, it does. Yeah? Yeah. The colours. Do you like the colours? Do you yeah, think they suit right. me? No, that looks really yeah? nice. Yeah? Yeah? Excuse me, can I just ask you, do you think this, this suits me? What do you think? Um, I think it does. Yeah? Yeah, the colour's nice, it isn't is it? Nice. I like the... I yeah. love this pink. It's really yeah, nice, isn't it? Nice. Yeah. yeah. The whole outfit looks all right. It does look nice. Yeah? yeah. Well, I thought she felt she looked nice in it, and I just didn't think that it was fair to tell her that she didn't. Excuse me, this suits me, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah? What do you think about the colour? I didn't like the colour. I think the colour suits you. I think the colour suits yeah. me. Yeah. She looked like really happy that she found something that she like really liked. I didn't really want to let her down, I suppose. Do you think this yeah. suits me? Yeah, it does. Yeah? Yeah, it does, yeah. yeah? She probably shouldn't wear a top like that. It was a bit young for her. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. yeah it's nice. Yeah. I think she thought that she looked quite nice in it. Because if you thought you looked really awful in it, you wouldn't go and ask someone, would you? I wouldn't. Does it suit me? Yeah? You think, yeah? Is it good? The colour good? All these people were reading Trisha's mind before answering. Colours look nice. Colours are really good. Yeah. Colouring, isn't it? Yeah. It's even better, isn't it? Do you think so? Is that nice? It shows just how often we use this skill to get on with people better. On the bottom, it looks limp. Look nice and soft. Yeah. Kind of. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for your help. Out in New Zealand, things are becoming more relaxed between Mia Bragg and the woman who will in two days' time be her mother-in-law. I think my relationship with Mia has progressed over the last few days. I think at the beginning she kind of, kind of sat back and kind of not withdrew, but probably was thinking a lot more and pondering about things, where now she'll come forward more and talk more directly to me, which is a big thing. Did you meet Ginny? No, we, we were running late to oh, pop to the hairdresser, so he literally ran in and got the... Um, it's Mia's mind-reading skills that are helping her better understand no, and get on with Mira. I think Mira is probably quite nervous about the wedding, so I'm being kind of very, very positive and I suppose given her lots of praise and things I know she's already set up or organised. Do you like the ribbon? Yeah, that she's got the... Because I think that would be perfect for my necklace. And I'm reassuring her on any situations or decisions that she made before I got here were the right ones. I think I made the right decision putting it in my suitcase. And over the last couple of days, I think I know from eye contact we're OK with each other. No, it's really it's going to be fine. Yeah. No, it is going to be fine. Do you like? Yes, I do. It's very nice. Yep. If I didn't think it was nice, I'd <laughs> You would tell me. <laughs> but I wouldn't tell you, but I think you'd sense that I would. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Mind reading allows us to understand and even win people round, but it also allows us to manipulate and deceive them. And that's what's brought me to a rather unassuming office in central Munich. In 
September 1938, two men came face to face in this room. And during this meeting, the lives of millions of people were affected by how well these two men read the mind of the other. One of these men was the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain. The other was Adolf Hitler. Hitler already had control of Austria and looked set to invade other countries. Chamberlain was one of the few men who could stop him. Now together, in this room, Chamberlain demanded Hitler's word that no further military action would be taken. Hitler gave it. After months of negotiation, the situation now largely depended on whether or not Chamberlain would believe him. He did. Historians now believe Hitler read the Prime Minister's mind like a book. He calculated that Chamberlain was so desperate for peace that he would believe this reassurance. Chamberlain's failure to read Hitler's true intentions bought Germany valuable time. It shaped the course of the war and affected the lives of millions. In all of history, there can have been few lies which have had as far-reaching consequences as this one. But at its heart, it was still just one man's brain against another. Hitler got away with it because he read Chamberlain so well. Mind reading had enabled one man to manipulate another. To lie, we need to read the mind of the person we're trying to deceive in order to work out what they know. But it seems this is so challenging for our mind that it can also be what gives us away. By studying the way our mind creates lies, psychologist Richard Wiseman has become an expert at spotting them. I went to his laboratory to find out how good I am at lying. So I'm going to ask you to describe two evenings, last Monday and last Wednesday. Right. And one of the two our descriptions I want to be the complete truth, the other a complete pack of lies. So we can start off by, uh, if you can tell me about last Monday. Yeah, well, Monday I went to the Royal Society of Medicine where I gave a lecture. Um, As my stories unfolded, it soon became clear that Richard was barely listening. Instead, I was being watched. It was one long rectangular table. With the but what were Richard and his team looking for? Well, they knew that depending on which story I was telling... Tell me about Wednesday evening. Yes, my Wednesday. mind was doing two very different things. Invited to a dinner which was celebrating the end of the football season was really... When I was telling the truth, my brain was effortlessly recalling the memories of a real evening so I could describe them to Richard. But when I was lying, my brain was having to do far more work. First, I was using many areas of my brain to read Richard's mind and work out what he knew. Then, the planning area at the front of my brain used all this information to tailor my story to make it more believable. That particular room is quite a big... It's one of the big... Yeah, it's quite a big... Uh, it's one of the big... Uh, but all this proved too much. It didn't feel like it, but this area was becoming overloaded. All this mental effort had made me display to Richard and his team the telltale signs of a liar. Throughout this, I've been telling you the complete truth. 
OK, so we had two accounts there on the Monday at the uh, Royal Society of Medicine giving a talk and on the Wednesday at the House of Commons. Yes. Now, uh, the second one of those was uh, was a complete lie. I regret that it was a total lie, yes. <laughs> How irritating. <laughs> <laughs> so we've analysed your body language, the way you phrased yourself and, and, and so on. And although the lie looked uh, very plausible, in fact, you gave off lots of the signals which are very typical. Oh, I thought I was lying. lying really well. You were lying very well. I mean, it was, it was very convincing, but still, there were some, some signals in there. When you were telling the truth, you were very animated with your hands. I was anxious because I knew I was going to give a very unusually controversial talk. Um, uh, the impact that my take... And, and that's typical of a truth teller. When it came to the lie, suddenly the gestures cut right the way down. The um, guest speaker was... Um, um, Sir Alex Ferguson. Yes, I've, throughout this I've been telling you the complete truth. And this is linked to what's going on in, in your mind. First of all, you're thinking. You're having to think harder about the answers. And when we think, we cut down on uh, movement, both of our heads and body and, and, and so on. In terms of eye contact, when you were telling me the truth, you tended to look me in the eye. <laughs> Very gracious in the way she gave the vote of thanks. When you're lying, you looked away. And how many people were there, roughly? Well, around the table, I suppose there were about 28 people. But I rather overstepped the mark a bit. Uh, and uh, I arrived a bit late. In terms of the actual words you used, when you were telling the truth, the word I, me, my, came up all of the time. I was... I was, I was, I, I suppose, I was, my, my view is. That, that's not surprising. This is an autobiographical memory. So it's very easy to obviously put yourself in that, that position. When it came to the lie, you hardly mentioned yourself at all. So although you're a very good liar and both the stories are convincing, the telltale signs were definitely there. Lying is difficult. You have to think through what does the other person know or what could they find out. It's about getting into somebody else's mind. Exactly. So in our social lives, we use our brain's amazing powers to mind read and get on with people. <laughs> but of course, socialising is only the start of the story. How we deal with other people affects almost every aspect of the world we live in. In ways we may never realize, we try to work out what others are thinking before deciding what to do ourselves. Mind reading drives our economy and shapes our society. It makes a place like this work a place like this. It's what allows you to understand and accept that people have different interests and different views. That they believe things that you yourself may not believe. And this is what allows us cultural and religious tolerance. This same skill lets you see the world through the eyes of people you've never even met able to imagine living other lives, we can create and appreciate so much of art, literature, and even entertainment. But of all these things, what many of us value most is the chance that our social mind gives us to be intimate with those closest to us, to like, to care, and even to love. going to make me cry. Hi, Mia. Just want to wish you all the very best. I love you lots. I love you all the time. Love you. I can hear you creaking. You <laughs> <laughs> better give him that instructions and I just want to do it later. Mira thinks I'm good 
for Matt and I think that's made the whole process of getting married so much easier. I mean, it could have been so different. It does make me feel really kind of relieved and relaxed, I suppose, that I have been accepted. She is a pleasant girl. She's gentle, she's caring, and she is nice and I like her, so I feel totally relaxed with her. I didn't feel that right at the first instance that I met her. That is something that um, comes with being together in time. We all want to wish you the richest blessings that marriage can bring. Don't we, family and friends? Too right. I will endeavour to do what I can for Mia because she is part of the family. Matthew and Mia, I now pronounce you to be husband and wife. You may now seal those wonderful vows you made with a very good kiss. <laughs> 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 I don't think my brain actually probably knows what it's done in the last week or so. It's had to cope with a whole range of situations that it has never had to cope with before. It probably would have been a lot easier if I'd met somebody in an Edgware pub. But no, you can't help who you fall in love with. <laughs> Over the years, we've made huge advances in our understanding of how the various areas of the body work. But in many ways, the mind has been the least understood. That's partly because its workings are so intricate and because we haven't until recently had the right technology to study it. But I also believe it's because, like a reflection, we're asking our mind to understand itself. And that's why it's likely there'll always be certain things about it we'll never quite be able to grasp. But what I find exciting, and what we've looked at in this series, is that each discovery we do make about how the mind works makes us better at using it. And if we can use our mind better, the picture of what makes us who we are might, after all, become clearer. See if you can tell a real smile from a fake one. Log on to BBCI at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash science.